morning all. Morning. morning. My, uh, my phone said 9.59, I figured by the time I stood up, it'll be 10 o'clock. We don't want to leave our folk online behind. Good morning, great to have you with us here in the room, those online, um, our musical ensemble and all those uh, working in the background with the technical things. Wonderful to have you with us and serving us this morning. Uh, we gather, of course, on Ngunnawal land and um, acknowledging God as the creator of all people and the Ngunnawal people as the traditional custodians here, paying our respect to their elders past and present and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Let's begin. At just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand to sing. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and each other, and as we do, please be seated. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we know that we are born as imperfect people and are unable to escape our sinful human nature. We confess to you, Almighty God, before the whole company of heaven and to each other, that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. Have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. Forgive us all our sins and bring us to eternal life. Amen. Christ lived, died, 
and was raised to bring us new life and the assurance of God's pardon and love. So by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I announce the grace of God to all of you. You are forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. His love and his forgiveness set you free, strengthen you to do his will and keep you in eternal life. The peace of God be with you. We stand as forgiven and loved children of God. Amen. Shout praises to the Lord, everyone on this earth. Be joyful and sing as you come in to worship the Lord. You know the Lord is God. He created us and we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep in his pasture. Be thankful and praise the Lord as you enter his temple. The Lord is good. His love and faithfulness will last forever. Glory to the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. Let us pray for the compassion of Christ. Merciful Father, you have freed us from guilt through your Son and called us to work with him in your kingdom. Help us to be as compassionate with others as he has been with us. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading this morning comes from the Old Testament, uh, Exodus chapter 19, reading from verse 2. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to, the, up to God. The Lord called, him, called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you'll, you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom, kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And the epistle reading comes from Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God provides, it proves his love for us in that, why, why, in that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. And a reading from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 9, beginning at verse 35 and through to the first part of chapter 10. Then Jesus went about all the villages, all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. 
When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the, Can Canaan, the Cananean, we will get there, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. We respond to God's word confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Finally. All right, if we have any kids today, that would be great if we could join me up the front. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, not the, the gospel reading that Pastor just read out, but I'm going to be talking about the reading from the book of Romans, in which there was a little bit that said something along the lines of, sometimes we suffer, and from our suffering we learn endurance, and from our endurance we can learn hope. So I'm going to tell you guys about probably the worst thing that I've ever had to go through. And because this is one of the worst things that I've ever had to go through, you'll see how uh, lucky I've been in my life. Uh, I spend a lot of time up here talking about my dog, Misty. She's the, the best dog in the world. And, um, <laughs> sorry. A couple of years ago, I got home from work and Misty was clearly very, very sick. When I'd gone to work that morning, she was okay. And when I got home, she was very sick. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. So I took her to the vet. Um, and at the vet, they were able to work out that while I'd been at work, she had been bitten by a snake. I'm really glad they were able to work that out because they were able to give her the right medicine when somebody's been bitten by a snake, whether they're a person or whether they're a dog, if you give them the right medicine early enough, you can actually make them really, really better. And they could do that. If we could go to the next slide. She got pretty sick, but she did start getting better. If we could go to the next slide as well. And in the end, it took about a week and a half for being living with the vet. But eventually, she got back to her old self. I really wish that hadn't happened. I really wish she'd been okay, that she hadn't been bitten by that snake. But because she was bitten by that snake, I had to help her. And I had to learn that I could help her. I had to learn that I, she could be okay again after something bad happens to her, and that I could be okay again after something bad happened to her. 
the reading in Romans today talks about that too. That sometimes really bad things can happen to us. And I wish they didn't. I really wish bad things didn't ha happen to people, but sometimes they do. But when they do, there are people who can help us. In the case of my dog, it was the vet. In the case of us, it's the sort of people around us, and it's that fella up there. God can help us, and can help us endure the bad things. And from enduring it, we can learn that actually things can be okay again. We can have hope that we can be okay again. Sorry that was a bit of a downer today. But even when things are really sad, they can be happy again. Eventually, if we just go back to that slide, you can see how happy that dog looks. That was taken about a month after this nasty thing happened to her, where she was uh, able to start chasing a ball again. And I do not understand how she got better so quickly. And I'm really glad that she did. So I'd like us to pray for a moment. Lord God, thank you for giving us the hope that even when bad things happen to us, we can endure them and you can strengthen us through them and that we can live in the hope that we can be okay again. Amen. seated. We're going to spend a few moments with uh, those words in Romans. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, how is it that you would die for me. Open my heart to hear you speak into my life. Amen. This past week, a lot of people have been, uh, for some reason, asking me about my previous ministry, um, which, if, if you're not aware, I've spent about the last 20-something years in army chaplaincy. Um, and I'm not going to talk about that here because it would bore you to tears, but if you are actually interested, happy to talk offline or, or in your small groups if you want me to come and share a few videos and, and talk, I'm happy to do that. But there were some phrases in our readings this week that took me back into that space. Um, and some of them were in the, the, the longer part of the Gospel reading that we, I'm glad we didn't read. It was very long, but it talked about the Apostles' um, being told to be as wise as serpents, as innocent as doves, being dragged before governors and kings, and, and I had my fair share of input to Senate estimates and ministerials and things like that, which I know a number in the room know what that's like. Um, but it wasn't that. And it wasn't even the Old Testament reading uh, that spoke about the Israelites camping in the, de in the wilderness and wandering in the desert. Uh, and in the army, we did a lot of that as well. But it was this Romans reading 
where Paul spoke of boasting in our sufferings, and Cam talked about it, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Building resilience and endurance and character is an essential part of military training. And now I'm having flashbacks to my ab initio training. I'm sure Tony and others in the room are doing the same. Um, those of you who aren't in the military, it's what the Americans call boot camp. So it's that, you know, they really get stuck into you. Um, as chaplains, I mean, we did that. But what interests me more is that we would get involved then in the delivery or the assistance of character training and development. And, and in that training, uh, we'd unpack the ethical and moral components of service. But in that training, we'd ask two questions. What are you prepared to kill for? What are you prepared to die for? That first question's really quite confronting and um, sometimes leaves us a little squeamish although it's a necessary question um, in our fallen world that needs to curb unjust aggression. I mean, we never imagined the situation in the Ukraine uh, at the moment, let alone Sudan and everywhere else in the world. But it's a question that does need careful, honest and ethical consideration by nations, by politicians, by soldiers, sailors and aviators and cops who were given the burden and the responsibility of using lethal force. And unless you've been living under a rock, you will have seen all the commentary and proceedings around the Ben Robert Smith case and how critical that consideration is. I don't know if you've heard of a fellow called Gilbert Keith Chesterton or G.K. Chesterton, an English writer, philosopher, Christian apologist, he was a convert to Catholicism and an advocate for social reform, um, but he was also a literary and art critic, and, um, and some of us just know him as the guy who wrote the books that led to the TV series Father Brown. Um, maybe that's the only reason you know him. That's fine too. He's a bit of a go-to guy for quotes, because everyone loves a dead guy quote. Um, so he's got a whole stack of them that people draw on, and some of them are dodgy and some of them are quite inspiring. Um, a couple of the ones I do like, um, to have a right to do a thing is not at all the same as to be right in doing it. Um, another one in the literary space, a good novel tells us the truth about its hero, a bad novel tells us the truth about its author. I quite like that one. Um, well, the Bible tells us to love our neighbours and also to love our enemies, probably because generally they are the same people. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, now, bear in mind he wrote this about 100 years ago, and it's pretty poignant. Religious liberty might be supposed to mean that everyone is free to discuss religion. In practice, it means that hardly anybody is allowed to mention it. Perhaps he was ahead of his time in that one. Um, but some of the more humorous ones, I know some of those were humorous, but I do like, don't be so open-minded that your brains fall out. I thought it was okay. Um, the word good has many meaning, meanings. For example, if a man were to shoot his grandmother at a range of 500 yards, I would call him a good shot, but not necessarily a good man. <laughs> and, um, and for those who are a little more quirky in their humor, uh, he said, poets have been mysteriously silent on the subject of cheese. I'm not quite sure about that, that's a bit weird. Anyhow, I digress. It, in this character training, we would draw heavily on, on a quote from, from Chesterton that, that says this, and, and excuse the non-inclusive language, but he said, the true soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. And excusing also the limitations in our contemporary asymmetric warfare environment where there's really no in front or behind a lot of the time, but a true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. And it was relevant in our character training as we're asking new recruits and officer cadets, what are you prepared to kill for? What are you prepared to die for? And when we get to that second question, Perhaps that's more difficult or problematic. Um, if I kill because my nation or the protection of others requires it of me, I might be unaffected by that 
because I'm able to morally process it, or I might carry a moral injury if the circumstances troubled my moral norms, even if it was fully legal and justified. But generally, I get to come home, assuming that I haven't uh, conducted war crimes and got incarcerated, um, as we touched on earlier. But if I die for the cause, if I die for something, and I have no sense of eternity, what then? It's one thing to say you're willing to die for something. It's another thing altogether to do it when push comes to shove. Another famous philosopher, Brian Adams, yes, I am joking, um, he's saying, yeah, I would fight for you, I lie for you, walk the wire for you, yeah, I'd die for you. Would he, though? Or should he be more honest, like the mighty, mighty boss tones who ask themselves if they ever had to knock on wood? I wonder if I could. I'm not a coward. I've just never been tested. Might be a coward. I'm afraid of what I might find out. Should apologise for all the music references. I blame Ingo. I was talking music with him when I was prepping this, and I think he subconsciously influenced me. Um, but dying for something, for someone, that's big. It's not natural for our selfish human nature. And I put this question in the bulletin, and I put it up there, um, who would you die for? And I said it's a question packed with controversy and dilemma, and more than a bit of hypothesis, as most of us will never need to act on that for real, really, or to answer that question, at least hopefully. Some, unfortunately, will and do. But most likely, it's, it's an academic question for us. But if you were in that situation, could you? And for who? Maybe family, maybe your kids or your partner. I mean, people have. Has to be someone who you love more than life itself. One of the soldiers I worked with in, or, or was talking to in my chaplaincy had, had a tattoo that went all the way down the length of his arm that said, greater love hath no one than this to lay down their life for their mates. Now, this poor soldier had no idea who he was quoting or where it came from. Um, and, of course, it was Jesus in John 15 talking or making a point about us being his mates, us being his friends. But a soldier might, in the heat of battle, sacrifice themselves for their mates or perhaps for the ideal of a loved one left behind, something beyond themselves, perhaps, and in the heat of battle. But I've made the point at times to senior military leaders and recruiters that the notion of self-sacrifice is not what it used to be. That in a post-Christian or post-Christendom world, in postmodern individualism, particularly a Western uh, individualism, when there's nothing greater than me and nothing transcendent beyond me and no knowledge of an existence beyond the now, why would someone sacrifice themselves for an ideal? A fight and die in combat. It's so final. It's so anti-self. And perhaps in the heat of the moment or of combat, for mates or if loved ones are immediately threatened, but that doesn't motivate people to sign up from the comfort of their comfortable existences and give of themselves in service necessarily. So how are we to respond to Paul's truth in his letter to the Christians? Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person that perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Not because we were righteous, not or even good, or could offer anything in return while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Maybe we will struggle with the question on the slide. Maybe we don't need to dig too deeply into it. But if we even begin to think through the depth of that question, who would you die for? 
we can't ignore the significance of what Paul is saying about Jesus here. We can't ignore the depth, the depth of his love for us, that he would, that he did die for us. And we usually gloss over it because it's so familiar, but sit with that for a moment. We could unpack the why he needed to. That's a whole another sermon. Uh, spoiler alert, it's our rebellion against God, our sinful nature and reality. But for today, sit with an appreciation of the depth of God's love for you. Rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If God has shown such love for me, how can I not be moved? How can I not be changed? Or at the very least, flabbergasted, um, motivated to live for him, at least to respond in some way. And I say that not in the sense of emotional manipulation, but a grounded appreciation of the depth of God's love. And because that dying for me is not some kind of warped, look at me and how much I love you, but it's a rescue mission, a raid if we want to keep using the, the uh, military analogy, to snatch us from the hands of the evil one, from an eternity of death, from a life without the intimate love and blessing of our creator and from a life of selfishness and self-centeredness to change our heart only you can answer for yourself what you're going to do with that what you have done with that but as you do as you contemplate that rejoice that this love this forgiveness is offered freely rejoice in the privilege of offering our own lives in service to god and the world as a sacrifice of praise. Rejoice in Christ and our resurrection because that's not the end of the story. I mean, we, we are privileged in this country that this doesn't mean, our faith doesn't mean putting our life on the line. In some countries it does. Pray for those Christians for whom this is a real and a daily question. What would we die for? Thank God that for us, the cost of our discipleship is, is not our lives. At worst, it might be some mild embarrassment or ostracisation, perhaps a cost of time and money and ourselves as we seek to love those who God has put in our paths, who, those whom Christ was willing and did give his life for. And pray for the Holy Spirit to help us sinners to bring other sinners on the journey and into that life of grace, of love. The peace of God which passes all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds safe in Christ Jesus. Amen.
please join me in our offering prayer. Thank you, Lord, for calling us and giving us so many gifts, both physical and spiritual. Help us to go out and serve you by showing your compassion and love to others. Amen. We know that God in his love wants to give us more than we can ever ask for. So let, so let us pray for all his people through faith in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have found us in our desperate need and have gathered us into your flock, the church. Fill us with compassion for those who are disadvantaged in our community and across the world and help us to share what we have received so abundantly from you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Teach us in our task as your representatives here in this community. Guide our worship so that it brings your grace and peace to all who attend and make every activity in this congregation of Holy Cross bear fruit in your kingdom. And we pray for those who serve us here at Holy Cross, Pastor Darren, our deacons, and those who help at Playgroup. We also pray for our wider church. We especially pray for the eight working groups considering various aspects of the ordination of women in our church. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our nation's leaders, the Commonwealth Parliament, the Prime Minister and Cabinet and Departments, our own Chief Minister and the ACT Legislative Assembly and the whole system of government. Help us each in our personal task as your representatives in the world. Keep us close to you in prayer and study and give us a clear understanding of the contributions we can make. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless young people journeying in the church as they grow. Give them joy in their faith and strength in their commitment to Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remove hatred with your grace everywhere. Alleviate all suffering and provide for those who have been displaced by war, famine and political unrest. We continue to pray for peace and an end to conflict, particularly in Ukraine and Sudan. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As this is Refugee Week, we pray for refugees the world over. We bring to you the people in Sudan, the refugees crowding the camps of Kakuma and Dabad, Dadab in Kenya, the Rohingya refugees in the camps in Bangladesh, the Ukrainian refugees across Europe. And we also pray for the asylum seekers that have made it to Australia and New Zealand. May they find peace and new life here. Watch over all who are sick or suffering in, in any way and meet the needs of those we know personally in this community. Klaus and Irene in vain, Joan Altoft, Albert Lake, Suzanne Wrench, Matt Hills, Joanna Hennig, Jean Winky, Laurie Hunter, Fiona Keller, Sheba, Priya as she recovers from flu, and the Schubert household, who is, in, who is engulfed with COVID at this time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we put into your merciful hands all those who perform, all those people whom we pray for, through your Son Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And as Christ has taught us, so let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours. Now and
Indeed, as we just sang, we go with God's blessing. The Lord seeks willing labourers for the harvest. Therefore, go out into the world, proclaim the good news of the nearness of God and call all who will hear to wholeness, to life, to holiness. Indeed, the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Lord, look upon you with favour and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.